Hey there, campers, soldiers, villagers, haters, followers, military vets, truckers, whoever you are, welcome. Dave Politis, k and Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. Thanks for being here. This is a missing person segment. And we're going to cover a few things here that are important. First of all, a huge thank you to everyone out there that purchased the book and the hat. Under, understand what the word liberty means. That should be front and center in your vocabulary. But probably the best-selling book of all time by us, Missing 411 Washington. It's a huge book. It's uh, 333 pages, lots of photos, very sad stories about the state of Washington, unexplained disappearances. You can get the book, the hat, and the bald eagle pen on our website, NA, like North America, NA Bigfoot Search at yahoo.com. Go to the online store, get it there now. It would really help us. Thank you. So, in the past, I've talked about Wikipedia and their direct <clears throat> attack on me. Not too long ago, one of our researchers came up with something <laughs> that I think is stunning about Wikipedia. Now let's talk about it. So, Wikipedia has several pages. And one of them is, this is a list of people, this is quoting there. This is a list of people who disappeared mysteriously post-1990 and of people whose whereabouts are unknown or whose deaths are not substantiated except for people who disappeared at sea. Since the 1970s, many individuals around the world have disappeared whose whereabouts and condition have remained unknown. Many who disappeared are eventually declared dead in absentia but the circumstances and dates of their deaths remain a mystery. But the circumstances and dates of their deaths remain a mystery. Some of these people were possibly subjected to forced disappearance, but in some cases, information on their subsequent fates is insufficient. On that post, on Wikipedia's page for that description, are 10 cases I have written about in my books. 10 that they have stated were mysterious. Now, let's go over to, well, they have another page, it says the same thing, but about aircraft and sea disappearances. And there's two cases there that I have written about that are mysterious per their own description. Now, they wrote a page about me. They say, David Politis is a former police officer who is now an investigator and writer known primarily for his self-published books dedicated to proving the reality of Bigfoot. Really? And establishing the missing 411 conspiracy theory. Lie number one. I have never proposed any theory in my books. No, 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 Wikipedia is lying. Missing 411 is a series of books and films which document cases of people who have gone missing in national parks and elsewhere and assert that these cases are unusual and mysterious, contrary to data ana analysis, which suggests they are not actually statistically mysterious or even unexpected. Kyle Pulich, a data scientist and a host of the Data Skeptic podcast, documented his analysis of Politis' claims in an article, Missing 411, and presented it, his analysis to the skeptic camp in Monterey County Skeptics. He concluded that the allegedly unusual disappearances represent nothing unusual at all, and are instead best explained by non-mysterious causes, such as falling or sudden health crises, leading to a lone person becoming immobilized off trail, drowning, bear animal attack, environmental exposure, or even deliberate disappearance. After an, analyzing the missing person data, Pulich concluded that the cases are not outside the frequency that one would expect, or that there is anything unexplainable that he was able to identify. Okay. 
if they're going to rely on Polich, then why would they make two pages of mysterious disappearances of people and have 10 of my cases on there? Do you understand here what's going on? <laughs> they're crazy. They can't have one page that says these disappearances are mysterious and then another page saying these disappearances are not mysterious. You see what I'm saying? All this is, all that is, is a direct attack on me. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there that are just total lies about me. And it's meant just for the first time person who knows nothing about me, go to Wikipedia and there's thousands that do and read this about me and think, oh, Polias, he's a clown. <laughs> and in reality, it's all lies. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, this does drive me crazy. Now, there have been people that have tried to change that on Wikipedia. Some very senior people that have tried. And they told me many times, to their amazement, they changed it, and they're an editor, and somebody came back within seconds and changed it back. And they can't get an answer why. I wish there was an attorney out there that would sue them for me. I wish there was. I would love it. If there's an attorney out there that wants to take this on, you got my backing a thousand percent. It really has upset me over the years that they've done that to me. And you out there follow me. If the cases I don't describe are mysterious, I don't know what is mysterious. I'm sorry. And since we are talking about mysterious, we've got a very mysterious case for you today. The young man's name was Jared Negretti, 12 years old, went missing July 19th, 1991. He was an eighth grader in El Monte, California. El Monte is a very small city just east of the city of Los Angeles. Now he attended a Latter-day Saint church, just like I did when I was a kid, in El Monte and was a member of the church's Scout Troop 538, just like I was. Now, I wasn't a scout troop member in El Monte, but I was in Cupertino, and I was a scout troop member. So I understand what Jared was doing, because I did it. A little bit about the scout experience in the church. I thought it was exceptional. Uh, the leaders were great. The agenda was for you to learn life skills. Um, you did field trips in the woods. It was, it was the best. I have nothing bad to say about it. His parents were Linda and Felipe Negretti, who also were members of the church. Gerald, Jared was a young boy who was slightly overweight, never had been in the wilderness backpacking before. This is Jared with his backpack. He's a pretty good sized 12 year old, slightly overweight. His friend said he always carried some extra food with him like candy bars, candies, etc. Well, on July 18th, 1991, Boy Scout Troop 538 had organized a trip to the summit of Mount San Gorgonio, 11,500 feet plus, under Scoutmaster Dennis night. There were six Boy Scouts and Dennis on the trip. They planned it for a while. This was no leisurely walk in the park. It was many miles long. Getting up to one of the tallest mountains in that area of the world, the LA Basin area. The trip started in the San Bernardino National Forest at a place called Camp Taquitz and they hiked to a place called Dry Lake, just north of the summit where they spent the night. So this is a map of the general area. Here's Riverside, California, March Air Force Base, San Bernardino, Camp Taquitz, San Gorgonio Mountain, Big Bear Lake, Lake Arrowhead. I've documented people disappearing around here, around here, 
Mount Baldy, you remember, we talked about extensively. So these mountains have a history of uh, people who are disappearing, San Bernardino National Forest. So you kind of get the map of it. So on July 18th, they made their way to a place called Dry Lake, north of the summit, camped out for the night, everything went good. And then early in the morning on July 19th, the troop left and headed for the summit of the mountain. During the hike, Jared was the last in line and kept falling behind. Now, let me explain something. If you've never been above 10,000 feet, you have no idea how tough it is to hike. Now, kids are different. Kids have a lot of stamina, etc. Unless you're overweight and unless you've never climbed or you don't exercise a lot, it could be very rugged and it could be very tiring and you will fall behind. Uh, I can remember when I first moved to Colorado and the first time I was above 12,000 feet, just walking at 14,000 feet is a struggle. And I'm not kidding you. The first time I was there, I was, uh, I was from sea level and after several years of living in Colorado above 6,000 feet, I started to acclimate. It was a lot better. But taking a, a boy up to that level, it could be very tiring. So they're hiking, and late in the afternoon, Jared said he was tired. And at about 11,500 feet, he told the scoutmaster he, just, he was too tired to go on, and the scoutmaster told him to wait right here while the rest of the troop summited, and they'd be back, and they'd get him. Told him, don't leave, stay right here. Jared said, okay. So now the scoutmaster and five scouts summited up to Mount San Gorgonio. At about five o'clock, another hiker saw Jared going off trail in this same general area. And that hiker told him and stopped him and said, hey, going off trail here is dangerous. Don't do this. Jared acknowledged. Hiker moved on. So let me stop there for a second. Famous story about Jared Adadero, a missing three-year-old boy in the mountains of Colorado, northern Colorado. Two fishermen stopped him on the trail. And Jared asked them, hey, are there any bears around here? They said no, and walked away from a three-year-old. And he was never seen alive again. Now in this case, Jared may have looked older than 12. So the hiker that walked away from him may have felt okay about walking away. But if you have any inclination that someone was 12 years old on the trail alone, maybe you ought to stay with them. Just saying. So the group, the Boy Scout group, had left their packs a mile above Dry Lake where they had spent the night the previous night. So they didn't have any packs on, but all of them were carrying water, including Jared. And the scoutmaster said when Jared was last seen, he had a canteen filled with water. Well, at about 6 p.m., the scout pack returned to that location where they last saw Jared. He wasn't there. They made a quick cursory search of that area. They couldn't find him. And the scoutmaster took the group down to where they left their packs told him to camp here, and he essentially ran 12 miles back to where their car was parked to call the San Bernardino County Sheriff and the U.S. Forest Service and said they had a missing boy. He got to his car at 1.50 a.m. Jared had last been seen by that other hiker at 5 p.m. going off trail. He had a canteen, and really that's all they thought that he had. Rescuers stated later that there was tons of water on that mountain, so nobody would die from dehydration. Remember that. So at 1.50 a.m., the calls made into emergency services. The next morning, about five hours later, 
searchers start rolling into that area. Now, a sheriff did come out, took a report, and immediately called for a search and rescue call out for that next morning. And they did get people out there at 7 a.m. Now, Mount San Gorgonio is also called Old Grayback. Highest peak in Southern California, 11,500 feet and change. It's 27 miles east of San Bernardino, the city in the San Gorgonio wilderness, wilderness, which is about 130 square miles. Spanish missionaries named the mountain for San Gorgonius. Just a little bit of a side note for you. Now, kind of a close-up view of where Jared, or where, uh, yeah, Jared disappeared. Here's Camp Tequitz. This is where they camped. And this is where the summit is. This is the San Gorgonio Wilderness, San Bernardino National Forest. Got it. Now you gotta remember something. And what was Jared's state of mind when he was last seen? He was tired. He was told to wait there. Why would he move on? I don't know. It's puzzling. By all accounts, Jared was a good student. Smart kid. Had never been on the mountain. Had never been backpacking before. So knowing all that, he should have stayed right where he was. Did something spook him? Something scare him? You do have point of separation. The troop left him alone. Now, the morning of July 20th, search and rescuers come out, and I can tell you that this is just going to be the mindset that they're going to find him right away, because they normally do. 95% of the time, Missing people are found quickly. It doesn't go into a long search. But quick, but the searchers quickly realized that something was up, something was up, and this wasn't going to be quick. So they had 25 searchers that first day. They went out, looked, searched the area he was last seen in, found nothing. July 21st, searchers found tennis shoe tracks around boulders at 11,000 feet, and they lost those prints around those large boulders understandable. Large boulders, granite. Large boulders, granite. Well, they lost them in there. San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office realized that something was happening here and they needed more people, more resources, and they got them. July 22nd, 70 searchers got on the mountain. Two agencies, three tracking dogs. They were still searching that four square mile area, which is a standard area to search for a missing person his age. Again, nothing unusual, still tracking the same way. July 23rd, the sheriff called for more resources and he got them. The U.S. Mountain Division joined the search with 25 soldiers that were initially deployed for three days with three canines from the El Toro Marine Base. And once the scope of that search expanded, 25 more Marines came, then 25 more, until suddenly we had 100 Marines on that mountain looking for Jared. They also had three canines from the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Search and Rescue Team. So six dogs were on the mountain. July 24th, Marines were still searching on the ground, ground pounding, and they had a helicopter with FLIR that spent three days flying the mountain. FLIR highlights heat on the mountain. Our body puts off heat. Animals put off heat. So as you're flying along at dusk, a body, a human moving on the trail 
is highlighted on the screen. You can't miss it. It's a really good device to find people. They were using it and they didn't find them up until then. July 25th, search and, area, search and rescue area was expanded and they brought in to a total of 200 searchers have tracked and retracked the initial four square miles and that area was now expanding. They said that they were sure he wasn't in that four square miles, two miles by two miles. So they needed to expand it. July 26, they made an interesting find. They located an area where it appeared Jared had slid on, a, slid on his butt down the side of the mountain. They followed it down and at the bottom of this little rise, they found his camera. And they also found some candy wrappers. Well, they quickly called his parents and said, yeah, he, that's his camera. And they had the photos on it developed. I gotta say, folks, I've been doing this a long time. I've seen a lot of pictures, some very shocking pictures. I call this next picture a very sad picture. Because remember, this is 1991. This is way before selfies were selfies. Everyone does selfies now. But Jared did a selfie. He took a picture at dark of his face. This is the picture. What does the picture tell you? That is Jared. It was taken at night and the flash did go off. I've heard a lot of things about that picture. Everyone says to, to them, it's sad. But what look is he exhibiting? I have no idea. But I'm sure that haunts his parents to this day, that photo. So they find the selfie. The next day, they decide that they're going to put his mom, Linda, in a helicopter. These helicopters have loudspeakers on them, and their loudspeakers are really clear. You can understand what's being said out of them, even above the rotors, the rotor sound. And they had her fly over that area and say, Jared, if you're anywhere, make yourself known, stand up, wave your arms. We love you. We're coming for you. They've been gone a week. And again, Jared, a 12 year old, a bigger 12 year old, a big target, in a location with a lot of water, would not have died from lack of water. There's no way, searchers said. So she made this plea July 28th. One of the search teams on the mountain were doing a super thorough search. I mean, they're walking shoulder to shoulder. They don't want to miss anything. And they come around a marijuana grow on the mountain. Not a small one, 7,100 plants. So the San Bernardino narcotics team came out there and took custody of all the plants. There is no evidence of anyone being around those plants in recent time. It had a, an advanced water system. So nobody needed to be there every day. Now, people say, well, Dave, uh, you know, these people that are missing and they walk into a marijuana grow and if somebody's there, they're going to kill them. Uh, no, they're not. No. People that grow marijuana, even the cartels, the last thing they want is a death on the mountain or somebody missing in their area. They don't want that because that'll highlight and that'll bring in hundreds of people into the area. If anything, they'll run. They don't want to be found. The only thing that they'll be, use violence against, people trying to take their product. Somebody stumbling in, they may scare them and tell them to leave, but nope, they won't hurt them. July 30th, there was intermittent rain on the mountain. And searchers didn't say that it slowed them down, but they were afraid it might have washed out any recent tracks that Jared may have made. 
July 31st. Marines still on the mountain. And I gotta tell you this, when your primary job is at search and rescue and you're dedicating yourself to the Marines like this, I admire you men and women who did that search. I appreciate you. Thank you for doing that. Let me stop the story real quick. Yesterday, I was at a, a wilderness outdoor show. It was pretty good size. And there was two search and rescue organizations there recruiting for people. I walked up, I talked to them, they didn't know who I was. And uh, what areas they covered, what they did. And they told me that uh, Glacier National Park won't allow in search and rescue teams. They use only their own searchers. I thought, wow. They said only rare times will they allow others in. I thought that's very odd. Hmm. But they also told me that Glacier National Park didn't require searchers to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Non-disclosure agreement meaning you won't disclose what you do, what you see in the park while you're searching. Other parks do this, but not Glacier. I thought it was fascinating. Back to the story. Well, a search for Jared goes into the middle of uh, August. They find nothing new. They keep up the numbers of 200 searchers a day covering that mountain day in, day out. Nothing was found other than the camera and some candy wrappers. The family got frustrated because they hadn't found anything about their son and they hire a private investigator. He made an interesting statement. He said it was obvious to him that Jared was abducted off the mountain. Okay, how do you abduct a 12 year old big boy forcibly off the mountain without others seeing it? Because you gotta go into a parking lot or into an area where there's other people where your car is parked if you're the abductor. I found that peculiar. What's even more interesting is in the same article, the family, specifically Felipe Negretti, stated that he didn't even believe his own private eye because there was no evidence of any criminal wrongdoing on that mountain or associated with Jared. Get what I'm saying? But people tend to go to that area when they have no evidence. There's no evidence that Jared left the mountain, but there's no evidence Jared is on that mountain. July 2001, 10 years after the disappearance of Jared Negretti, the 10 year anniversary, his dad, Felipe, said he had to climb the mountain on the same path and get to the spot where his son disappeared. And he got there and he collapsed. And he said he felt his son's presence there with him. I believe him. I believe him. I feel very, very sorry for the Negrettis. There was some finger pointing done to the scoutmaster that he didn't follow protocols, etc. And well, maybe he didn't. I don't care. I, I find no fault with him. Maybe he shouldn't have left a 12 year old on the mountain alone. I get that. I understand. You know, when I read this case many years ago, it reminded me of another case. The incident involving a woman named Michelle Vanek, who disappeared on Mount of the Holy Cross, September 24, 2005. She was hiking with a friend. She got tired. She said, you go on, you summit, I'll wait here. He came back, she was gone. Very similar. Almost identical circumstances.
Well, it's been over 30 years. 33, as a matter of fact. And Jared has never been found. An absolutely phenomenal fact, I believe, for not finding a boy that large, not finding his clothing, and only finding, really, this is the only thing Jared left us. I pray that his family found some peace somehow. I have no idea how, but I would tell people that if you're on Mount San Gregorio and you're hiking off trail, keep your eyes open. I thank you for being here. Please put this on your social media. Be safe. Light us out.